What up, what up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Let's Ask Paul. My name is Paul Abernathy, your host as always. Welcome to the podcast. This show is sponsored by Electrical Code Academy Incorporated. That is the corporation located in Texas that teaches you the National Electrical Code. If you're interested in learning more about the National Electrical Code, do me a favor. All you got to do is go to www.electricalcodeacademy.com.net.org. It doesn't matter. Jump on on there and you can... uh, learn about our programs. And we have programs that teach you the National Electrical Code from the 30,000 foot level. That's called the Fast Tracks Black program. But if you're already licensed and you want to deep dive into residential, commercial, industrial, grounding and bonding, I got a lot of people confused with grounding and bonding. I can tell you just from my recent episodes on the good old TikTok, if you want to venture into that, do me a favor, just jump on over to the website. Grounding and bonding is the purple program. And of course, if you're interested in the basics of electrical theory, paralleling series, circuits, and all that, then we have a program called the Fast Tracks Yellow as well. So it's color-coded. For simplicity's sake, jump on over to our website. Also, if you are looking for some unique swag, you want some stuff that says electrician, kind of like what I'm wearing here, although it's a podcast and you can't see it, but I do have one of our shirts on. This is the, what is this? This is the Master Electrician, and this is the the Gods of Current series that we have. All of these are uniquely designed by me personally, and we have Master Electrician, journey elect, Journeyman Electrician, uh, all kinds of good stuff over at electricianpride.com. So that's electricianpride.com. So check that out. All right. Well, as always here on Let's Ask Paul, we're going to answer some code questions that were submitted to me. And we'll do our best to give you our answer. Again, you can agree to disagree. That's your prerogative. I'm going to give you my 30 plus years of experience trying to dissect it out for you. So at the end of the day, let's get started. So the first one that was submitted to me that we're going to cover in today's uh, podcast is it says, Paul, I have a question for the NEC guru. Okay. All right. Uh, It's, you know, let me go on to do that. Yes. Got some clapping going on there. All right. It says... All right, that's enough of that. All right. It says, if I have five minute rated 10 horsepower, 208 volt, three phase motor with a nameplate rating of 28 amperes, I am permitted to use 85% for sizing conductors per 430.22E. That is correct. So stopping there, let me ask, I'm asking your, answering your question though. The first part is, yeah, so typically anytime we're sizing something like uh, the conductors for a motor, or we're doing short circuit ground fault protection for a motor. We're going to be using the nameplate for overloads. We're going to be using the FLC, which is in table 430.248, 249, 250, for sizing conductors and for sizing short circuit ground fault protection. So that would be where we start, and then we'll end up at 430.52. But correctly stated in your case, If you're using 430.22E, which is dealing with those intermittent duty, things like that type of motors, like for elevators and whatnot, absolutely, it directs you to use the nameplate rating and not what's in the FLC table, okay? So absolutely right. You're spot on with that so far. You go on to say, I do not see anything in Article 430 that states I am allowed to use a new adjusted nameplate rating of 23.8 amps, uh, which is what he says is it's 28 amps times 83% for anything other than the conductors. That is correct. You, you have your astute, and I can also tell this is a fast track student. So obviously our program and, and the individual that submitted this is, is sharp anyway, but we don't share names over here on Let's Ask Paul because your questions can come in and, you know, ask whatever you want. Um, so you're astutely correct. Now it says the GFSC, that's the ground fault short circuit protection, uh, and overload sized per 23.8 amperes. Okay. So again, remember overloads, you're going to be using 430.32 and you'll be using the nameplate. Okay. For short circuit and ground fault protection, typically you're going to use the FLC in the back of the book. Then you're going to go to 430.52, which is going to allow you to apply those, those rules there. Um, But in this case, you're absolutely right. For conductors, you're going to be using the nameplate values. You get the allowances that are in 430.22E, 100%. When it comes to the short circuit ground fault protection, you're still going to use the values that are based in the FLC. 
okay, for the motor, all right? So you're not gonna get the, you don't get the ability to use the nameplate for that. That's only for conductor sizing, okay? So the short circuit ground fault protection, again, it is what it is, okay? You're overloading, you're gonna be protecting, uh, again, 430.32, but when it comes to short circuit ground fault protection, you're still gonna follow your same course of action for whatever that horsepower motor is based on 430.248, 249, 250, and then use the, the values in 430.52. So you're, you're spot on for that, only sizing the conductors for those intermittent duties and things like that that's under 430.22e. Absolutely right. You use that for that. Everything else, follow the normal rules that you would uh, anywhere else. Okay? All right. So hopefully that answers that question for you. Uh, and we will go on and look at another question. All right. So let's see here. Let's go on and get into another question that was submitted to the Let's Ask Paul portal. This one says, good afternoon, Paul. Got a question for you. 12 AWG is generally rated in size for 20 amperes, correct? But 12 AWG can be used on larger breakers also. That is true. It says, I am wondering is... If that was on a test, which would be the correct answer? I think I got the wrong early. I think I got that wrong earlier. So, so this submittal looks like somebody is actually studying for their electrical exam. And so they're going through some practice questions or going through something and they're starting to understand or, or starting to really get that understanding of, okay, well, I know something is different in a sense that I can have a 12 gauge copper, let's say, keep it simple. Uh, I always also tell people all the time, if you're preparing for an electrical exam, you always wanna assume copper unless stated otherwise. Copper is always gonna be uh, the, the, the preferred choice as far as the NEC is concerned, unless it's stated otherwise, although you're perfectly okay to use copper aluminum or even copper clad aluminum, that's perfectly fine. Uh, understanding the restrictions and limitations in 310 and sizing and all that kind of stuff when it comes to the acceptable branch circuit size or feeder size or even service size conductors. Okay, assuming that is all taken into consideration. Uh, but in our case, dealing with small conductor rules and small conductors, especially like 12s and 14s, we're always going to think copper. Uh, but again, they make uh, 12 gauge aluminum. They actually make 12 gauge copper clad aluminum, uh, which has the ampacity equivalent to a 14 copper. I'm sure you'll, everybody knows that. But let's go on and answer this question. It says, would they, would they able, would they maybe ask for exceptions if they meant anything other than 20 amperes max? Uh, thanks for everything and have a great weekend. Okay, um, thanks for that submission. So let's talk a little bit about 12 gauge. So 12 gauge, when you look at the ampacities uh, of a conductor and you're looking at 31016, I'm in the 2020 edition of the National Electrical Code. Whatever edition you're in, uh, you know, it would be, if it's in the 2017 code, then it would be 31015B16. Um, nothing significantly changed, uh, except for the fact in the 2020 code, now 310.16, 310.17, 310.18, all of that's kind of changed a little bit when it comes to now they have their own sections that are specific in the code, and they do reference tables. Um, also, the term allowable has been removed for the 2020 because, again, it didn't really make sense. The impacity is what it is. So even after an adjustment or correction that's done on a conductor, it's still the impacity is what it is. So it's no sense in calling it allowable, right? Um, the other thing I tend to tell students, uh, and I'm answer answering your question, is that the impacity values that are listed in 31016, if you're in the 2020, um, or in the, the 2017 or prior, those ampacities are continuous, okay? So when we do things for like continuous load, that's a, a fictitious exercise that we are simply sizing something with an additional 25% capacity, maybe because of the, uh, the, the limitations of an overcurrent device or something. So we're, we're told to do that. Now the code tells us in many occasions to take something as uh, at 125%, not necessarily stating it's a continuous load, but tells you to take it at 125%. A good example of that would be a branch circuit to a water heater, right? So if you're using 422.13, it tells you that the overcurrent device as well as the conductors are all the size at 125%. It doesn't say that's a continuous load. It just tells you that you size it at 125%, right? 
So, but there's other areas where you have to look at a load and say, look, what's the definition of a continuous load? It's a load that pulls its maximum current for three hours or more. Not, not a load that pulls half of their current or a quarter of its current or three quarters of a current. It's 100%. It's the maximum current for three hours or more. So this is why typically when we do lighting in a commercial building, um, that lighting is going to be on and it's whatever the, the, the lamp is irrelevant to the rating of the, of the luminaire. If you could, you could under lamp it, but you still go by the luminaire, right? So it could have somebody put the maximum size lamping in it and it's going to have this, this, this maximum value and it's going to burn for three hours or more. So that's its maximum current draw, okay? So even if it could be dimmed, it still has the potential to have its maximum. So that's why we do continuous loads in those type of areas. Now, when it comes to residential, it's all diversity. So we don't have to worry about it, continuous loads, except for where things tell us to take consider, uh, considerations for such things like, again, the water heater, uh, that type of thing. Uh, also, side note, you wouldn't take the 125% that you do for the water heater. When you're doing the service calculation, you don't take that water heater's load at 125%, okay? Sure, you all knew that, but uh, if not, that's a great opportunity to get in our fast tracks program where we teach you all those things. Okay, let me get back to your question. So, if you look at the table 310.16 for ampacity, you'll notice that if you go down and you see these little asterisks, since you're talking 12 gauge, you'll see that it has a 12 on the left side and it has a little asterisk. That asterisk uh, ends up sending you to the bottom and it's asking you to take a look at 240.4D. These are called small conductor rules, okay? So in this case, if you look at the table, that 12 gauge is good for 20 amps under the 60 degree, 25 amps under the 75 degree, and 30 amps under the 90 degree, okay? So that conductor at that condition of use, and what's the condition of use? 30 degrees Celsius, 86 degrees Fahrenheit, and not more than three current current conductors. Perfect world, right? Perfect world. And so if you look at the code, it, it actually explains all that if you look at 310.16. And it tells you that. So this is continuously, it could run, these currents could run forever and not have a problem on the insulation at all. However, we know the, the, the real world's not perfect. So you run into a situation where you're going to have a condition of use that's going to have to be, uh, it's going to affect that conductor's ampacity and you're gonna to have to adjust it or correct it accordingly, okay? And that's why we have the rules in 31015B1 or 31015C1 in the 2020 edition of the National Electrical Code. Now, if you're in the 2017 edition, that's 31015B2A and 31015B3A, okay? Just so you know, depending on what code cycle that you happen to be in who submitted the question. All right, so while we're here, let's go on and go and look at the small conductor rules because we've already established what the ampacity of a conductor is. But now we're going to go look at that asterisk and see what the small conductor rules have to say. So if you got your code book, and I know you do, and remember, this is a podcast. So if you would like to pause and go grab your code book, hopefully you have it, uh, and go on and pause it and then get your code book and get you to where you need to be. And then we will pick up from there. Okay, so I'm going to do that and go in my code book and I'm going to do just like you. And I'm going to go to 240.4D. And if you'll notice it, it says small conductors, right? So if you scroll down, you kind of go down your page, you'll notice that you get to 12 AWG copper, and it says 20 amperes. Now remember where you're at. You're in 240. So we're talking what? We're, we're in 240, so we're talking overcurrent protection. Now what is overcurrent made up of? Short circuit, ground fault, but is short circuit protection, ground fault protection? No, it's, it's if you're looking at it, it's overload, ground fault, okay, and short circuit protection, right? And so it's protecting it against you overloading it, okay? It's protecting you against uh, uh, short protection, gonna trip that breaker, yep, okay? So short circuit, ground fault, and overload are all made up of overcurrent, all right? So this is limiting you to what? 20, and in some cases you can get the breakers, like you say, they'd also have ground fault protection, GFCIs. Um, and by the way, the GFCIs also do the normal protection like a normal overcurrent protected device would do. All right, so here it says 12 AWG copper, and it says 20 amperes. So under the general rule, 
if you have a 12 gauge copper, it's got to be protected at 20 amperes. Okay, so it might handle more capacity based on the values of 31016, uh, depending on the condition of use. But you're still going to be limiting that to 20 amperes. So, so think of that as your general use, your general rule. Okay, but now what you have to look at is some other statements that are made, right? And if you look at D, and we'll read it, it says small conductors. It says, unless specifically permitted in 240.4E or G, the overcurrent protection shall not, okay? It's a mandatory statement, okay? It says, shall not exceed that required by D1 through D7 after any correction factors for a, uh, ambient temperature or the number of current carrying conductors or number of uh, or the number of conductors have been applied. Okay, easier to say that. All right, so, and it's alluding to if you're dealing in an ambient temperature that's other than 30 degrees Celsius, 86 degrees Fahrenheit, or you're dealing with more than three current carrying conductors, that type of scenario, which is gonna have an effect on the ampacity, right? Mutual heating from the conductors. Uh, it's going to be radiated to the other conductors. And so we're not trying to push the volatility of that insulation. Okay, so you have to adjust or correct accordingly to kind of build that buffer uh, because, again, current flows just generate heat. Okay, so if you look at this, we want to look at what it's saying. Now, the one that's probably, in your case, used for an exam is probably going to be the one that's referencing G. Okay, not, not so much E. E is talking about, again, some options where you do have some tap conductors and people think that you, you can't have, there, there's, there's no other tap rules like uh, things for like branch circuits and all. Well, you do have some protection requirements and you do have allowances for tap conductors and it does allow for that potentially to have a smaller conductor than what would normally be required to be protected by the overcurrent device. But that's under E and those, those rules will specifically send you to examples of that. Okay. Pretty straightforward. What I think you're probably going to answer your question, which you're probably going to see on the exam is something that's trying to tell you, well, G, you'll notice that it says air conditioning refrigeration equipment, 440, part three and part four. Well, those are the parts that deal with sizing of your conductors and things like that for your HVAC application. And it is very common for you to see a nameplate on an HVAC unit outside that says minimum circuit ampacity, maximum overcurrent protection. And people freak out, right? When they see a 10 gauge, right? and uh, uh, they have a 10 gauge and they end up terminating it onto a, a 50 amp breaker. It's extreme, but I'm just saying 40 amp breaker or whatever. And they look at it and go, wait a minute, you can't do that. The code says 12 copper, 20 amps. Um, well, the reality of that is that you, uh, you can, why? Because the code says that you can because of 240.4G by reference of 240.4D, and it's saying unless specific uh, it, that you use what's in D, right? And that's the 12 gauge 20 amp protection, unless you can apply 240.4G. So HVAC is one example of that. The other one, if you look down, uh, and I'm pointing out the more specific ones, is that you might get on an exam is the motors. Motors, you see part three, four, five, uh, six, whatever. That is also an occasion where you most certainly will have the short circuit ground fault protection, which is also going to pro provide that overload protection, is that is sized much larger than the potential conductors, and it's okay. It is okay because all it's trying to do is deal with that inrush current, and then it'll come back down to your normal uh, running current. So that is okay. It's still going to be considered protecting those conductors uh, and it's, you know, it's not a problem. So um, just keep that in mind uh, that that's what that's all about. And so hopefully that'll help you out with your question. So 12 gauge, 20 amp overcurrent protection. Um, but be very conscious of the fact that 240.4G allows you to have potentially a smaller conductor, but a higher overcurrent protection or so. And it's permitted here. So just be very conscious of that. Uh, on an exam, that type of thing. So hopefully that answered your question long way around it, but to give you a little extra insight into that that might help you if you're preparing for your exam, okay? All right, so we're gonna, gonna go on to another question for you. 
All right. So in this question, it was submitted. Um, it looks like it's kind of uh, from a, another individual. Uh, they must have submitted both of these at the same time. It says, good morning, Paul. I noticed you talk about using the tables for feeder and brand circuit opacity and not the nameplate of the motor, right? So it kind of goes with what we talked about earlier. Um, if you're doing, for example, the short circuit ground fault protection, uh, then for, for normal applications, not the ones I talked about earlier for the intermittent duty and periodic duty and all those in the 430.22E, but normal motors like continuous duty motors, things like that, you're going to size the short circuit ground fault protection that's required by 430.52. You're going to size all that based on the ampacity values that are found in 430.48, 249, or 250, depending on whether it's single phase or three phase, right? So that's, that's straightforward. Um, you just take whatever that FLC, that's full load current, and you multiply that by the multiplier on the table at 430.250. I mean, excuse me, 430.52. Uh, and uh, that's going to tell you whether or not you're using 250%, 300%, or whatever, depending on whether it's uh, time delay fuses, inverse time circuit breaker, or whatever it is based on that, okay? Uh, so you're using the, the tables for that. So he's asking, when would you ever use the nameplate for that? Well, I think I probably mentioned this earlier, that when you're sizing the overloads, Typically, in 430.32, you're going to size for the overloads, and that's going to use the nameplate uh, value. Now, a lot of times we'll refer to that as FLA, which is it's not officially that. Um, with FLC, full load current, is what you have in the tables for those ampacities for those motors, and those are kind of a fixed thing. So with the motors changing a little bit and efficiency of motors... When you're sizing circuits and every motor manufacturer is a little different, if you use the ampacity values out of the table, then you have consistency. So if somebody replaces a motor with another one of like horsepower, then you're pretty much, uh, even if the motor was more efficient, you're still sized based on the information that's on the tables. So you're going to be okay, right? It's kind of that protection fudge factor. Um, when it comes to the overload, that's very specific to the motor. And so that's where you would be in 430.32. And that is going to use the nameplate uh, current value. And the reason we call that FLA, we do, I mean, I'm just saying educators might call it that, uh, is that's just full load amps on the motor. And full load current is what the tables would direct you. So again, the only time you would use the amps from the full load amps from the nameplate is for generally is for the uh, overload protection. That you would do that again, barring those allowances in 430.22e for intermittent periodic duty things like that. Okay, so then you would use the nameplate for that as well. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Uh, that overcurrent protection is that short circuit ground fault. That is also going to be your overcurrent protection. Okay, um, and again, as we talked earlier, the conductors could be vastly smaller than what this protection. Is going to be right so if you're taking a motors brand circuits at 125 percent okay for the motor and you're sizing you know sizing the conductors per that uh for a single motor for example for 30.22 uh then that's done and then of course your short circuit ground fault protection is going to be vastly greater than that because you're using the same flc it's just you're doing the flc times 125 percent for the conductor but then you're doing up to you know 250% or even 300% depending on what overcurrent protection that you're using as your short circuit ground fault protection. So that could be vastly greater. And so it's going to exceed what you would. And that's okay because if you remember in the small conductor rules in 240.4D, we it talked about eluding to the ability to use the information in G, for example. And that's where you got the motor allowances. Right? Makes sense? So kind of hope that helps you out. I will remind you, we do have videos on motors over in our monthly subscription. If you're not familiar with that or any of you haven't been familiar with that, we do have that. Uh, so you can go check that out if you're interested in doing a monthly subscription for $9.99. Cancel at any time. It's totally up to you. Uh, if you want to really contribute, uh, contribute, what I say, contribute? If you really want to get to the program, then you do the annual 119 and you can come and go as you want for an entire year. Anything new that comes out, you get access to it. Uh, totally up to you. Uh, we don't uh, care either way. 
Um, but uh, check that out. Also, there is still a bunch of free stuff over on our website. You know, the mini courses, check them out all at electricalcodeacademy.com or .net or .org. It doesn't matter. Check them all out. And hopefully you learned something from today's episode. Uh, this morning, I actually mirrored this with a little little TikTok stream. <laughs> so I answered a bunch of questions over in TikTok. Um, I don't even know with that streaming whether or not the videos actually stay up there anymore that people could watch. I don't know if it's live and then once it's live, it's gone. I, I have no idea how that works. But anyway, I did it. I answered a bunch of questions this morning. Uh, I don't look for me to do that a lot, okay, uh, because I really don't care much for the TikTok platform, although I am on a mission for the next couple weeks to, to play with that platform. But again, it's um, three minutes. Anybody knows for me to convey something. And the fact that you only have a limited amount of text that you can reply to somebody and you can only do three minutes, um, it just makes it a hard platform for me to educate. Real easy for people to give snarky comments, but it's not really good to educate. So I have to keep the stuff brief and it seems like I seem to offend everybody. I'm just saying. You know, I don't know why. Why you keep offending everybody, bro? Hey, I'm not trying to offend anybody, but it just seems that everything that comes out of my mouth is offensive. Well, you are an offensive gentleman. Okay, I get it. Whatever. So anyway, check that out and uh, subscribe to all of our platforms. Again, appreciate it. Thumbs up. If you uh, don't like what we do, hit the thumbs down twice. Uh, but if you like what we do, hit the thumbs up once, and uh, we'll catch you in another episode of Let's Ask Paul, where you can submit your code questions over at paulabernathy.com, and I will do my best to answer them for you. Till next time, folks, stay safe. God bless.